Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. And again, good afternoon and good to see everybody in for another four programs. And uh, we always like to let our television folks know that we do tape four programs right in succession, a cup of coffee in between. And uh, that just sort of saves me a lot of driving back and forth to Tulsa as well as our studio class. And then that way we can uh, sort of set up our, our videos as well as our little booklets. The videos, of course, are three sets of these afternoon or four programs for a total of 12, six hours. And then uh, good volunteers, Jerry Poole and his wife are doing it mostly now. It began with a young lady out in Colorado. I'll always have to give her credit for thinking of this first. But anyway, all the videotapes are now being brought into print and each six-hour tape we now have available in a little spiral-bound book and uh, I'm amazed how people are responding to these little books. I would have never dreamed it, but uh, if you're interested, why you just give us a call on the 800 number or write to us and we'll send you out a list of the table of contents and uh, the cost and so forth. We don't like to spend any more time in announcements that we have to, so we want to get right back in and pick up where we left off in our last program, which of course is in Romans 1, verse 16 and 17. But before we turn back to it, I, I mentioned the last program that the word salvation there in Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Remember I made the comment that sometimes new versions just totally water down that word salvation and even I think multitude of church people do not really comprehend what all is involved in that one word salvation. Most people I think think of salvation as just a fire escape. It just means that they're going to escape going to hell and they're going to go to heaven when they die. But you see, the word implies so much more, and as I mentioned in the last program, I certainly didn't have time because I can just about list 11, 12, 13 aspects of that word off the top of my head. And we're going to do that in uh, whatever it takes this afternoon, one program, two, three, it may even take four, just to define that one word that the scripture uses, salvation. Well, we're going to start back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because salvation is, of course, based upon the gospel. And again, there is only one portion of scripture that lays out the gospel so completely, so clearly, and yet so simply as 1 Corinthians 15, these first four verses. And we want to start with that then, that when Paul refers to the gospel, this is what he's referring to. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning of verse 1 again. We've read it more than once on the program. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, that is, positionally, by which also you are saved. See, nothing else. We're saved by the gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain, for Paul says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now always remember, Paul is so adamant that he did not receive his gospel from the earthly ministry of Christ. He did not go back down to Jerusalem and check in with the twelve. But instead he had his own private seminary training with the ascended Lord from heaven out there on the desert. And when he came away from that experience, of course, he begins these doctrines of grace. And I've also been so stringent in maintaining that our gospel has to come primarily from the writings of this apostle because he is revealing things that are revealed to him from the Lord after his crucifixion, after his resurrection, after his ascension, from where he is now seated, of course, at the Father's right hand. And so always keep that in mind. In fact, when Hebrews begins in chapter 1, I think it is, uh, no, in chapter, uh, chapter 6, 
Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, and leaving behind the principles of Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, you don't just stay there. Those are elementary, and you don't stay in the elementary. You move on. I've always used the analogy of our, of our high school. In fact, I did in the class last night of our secular education. There's no way you can go into higher mathematics, mathematics if you haven't had second, third, and fourth grade arithmetic. I mean, it's just utterly impossible. But you don't stay in third and fourth grade arithmetic. You move on, see? Building on it. You still can't do math without those, those simple uh, calculations. That, that's basic. Now, same way with the scriptures, you see. We just keep moving on and moving on to further and further revelations. And so now when the Apostle Paul comes and he says that he is referring us to what he has received. Well, we've got to sit up and take notice. All right, read on. Verse 3 again, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sin, and that he arose, that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. It was all back during the Old Testament. It was all prophesied. But it was never really explained. No one understood. But now you see it comes out so plain that when he died, he died for the sins of the world as full payment for the sin penalty. But he didn't just stay dead. He arose from the dead victorious over sin and Satan and death and hell and the whole bit. And because he lives, we live. So that's the gospel that he died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he arose again from the dead the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, while you're in Corinthians, I'd like to have you back up with me to chapter 1. Because, see, this is all Paul knows throughout all of his epistles. The preaching of what he calls my gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God, and that's all he knows. All right, now in 1 Corinthians then, chapter 1, if you'll come down to verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18, and he says, For the preaching of the cross, see that? The preaching of the cross is to them that perish the unsaved world. It's to them it's foolishness. doesn't mean anything. And we're going to be looking at that when we get a little further down in Romans chapter 1, at how the world treats this gospel. But to us who are saved, it, the gospel, the preaching of the cross, isn't just a ticket to heaven. It's what? It's the power of God. See? It's the power of God. Now, I can't emphasize that enough. Because, see, this flies in the face of reformers. This flies into the face of the good works people. I had a letter just yesterday almost screaming at me. I mean, it was so ridiculous, I didn't even bother to finish it. We have to earn our way into heaven. Oh, horrors. How can anyone even speak it or think it, let alone write it? There's nothing we can do but take what God has offered. And that's what we're going to be looking at in these next couple programs, at least, maybe even three. The power of God. Now you drop down a few verses in this same chapter, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews, a stumbling block. Oh, they, they never could accept that he was who he said he was. To the Greeks, foolishness with all their high-level intellectual philosophy. Then they were to believe that this humble carpenter from Nazareth accomplished everything that Paul says he accomplished. Foolishness, see? But, verse 24 unto them who are called, that is, unto the true believer, unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the, and there's that word again, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see the difference? And see, that, that's a power that man can't even begin to touch. This is a power that is extraneous to anything human. And it's, as we're going to see, it's a power that has been exercised in our behalf that we can't explain except by faith. And that's what we're going to see when we get back to Romans 1 in 16 and 17. But before we go back there, I want to have you look at one more verse back here in Paul's other letters. Ephesians now. <clears throat> Ephesians 
Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 1. Drop down to, oh, I guess we can start verse 13. Ephesians 1, verse 13. And remember, Paul always writes to believers, and for the most part, Gentile believers. Now, we don't leave the Jew out because there is no difference, Paul says. There is no difference today between the Jew and the Greek so far as God's dealing in salvation is concerned. But the Ephesians, of course, were primarily Gentiles. And so he says to these Ephesian believers, and he'd just as well be writing it to us today, in whom you also trusted, now that's in italics, so it's been added by the translators, but it could also be in whom you believed, in whom you've placed your faith, after, now watch this carefully, after you heard the word of truth, the what? The gospel, see? That's why I had to start with 1 Corinthians 15. After we heard the word of truth, the gospel, that Christ died, was buried, and rose again, of your salvation, in whom also, after that you, what? Believed. Now what am I always saying? Just stop and think what a lot of people think should be in there besides believing. But it isn't. There's nothing else in here except believing. Then he says, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. My, what a loaded verse. You know, I've had people just almost drop their eye teeth as I read this verse. And they'll say, well, this flies in the face of everything that I've been taught from infancy. But see... There's nothing in here that can deal with an infant because an infant can't believe, an infant can't understand the gospel. This is something that only a, well, I was going to say mature, but at least someone old enough to understand right and wrong and that they're a sinner and need a salvation, understand the gospel, that Christ died for them. See that? And then after they've heard the gospel, they've believed it, then God moved in. We'll be looking at this later again. He seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise. All right, one more verse before we go back to Romans, and that'll be first, Second Peter, honey. Second Peter, chapter 3. Another verse that we look at periodically because it's such a loaded verse. In all my reading, I very, very seldom see somebody use this verse. I think maybe once or twice in the last years and years of reading have I ever seen anybody refer to this verse in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 15. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 15, where Peter, now remember he's at the end of his ministry, he's just shortly before he's martyred. Paul's gospel has been on the scene now a good many years. And even though I think Paul, Peter had a hard time comprehending it at the beginning, he still hasn't really got the full knowledge of it, but at least enough to tell us this much, and account or understand that the long-suffering of our Lord is what? Salvation, see? That's the whole theme of this book. From the time that... Man is created and falls in Genesis chapter 3 all the way to the end of this book. It's a book that is trying to bring about the salvation of a fallen human race. That's the whole theme of the book. And then in that regard, you can find Christ in one form or another on almost every page from cover to cover. Because this is God's main concern that the human race can find salvation. That's why he's done so much.